Oh, sorry. <laughs> to tie in that guy, I'm Wes Chatham. If you can tell, I'm excited because my 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 partner, my snuggler, my hugger, sometimes good time lover, Ty Frank, is back in town. He had the poopies last last week, and he wasn't feeling good. <laughs> had a little stomach virus. But now he's back, and uh, and I feel I feel like uh, I feel alive again. You know, I feel like I mean, listen, we love uh, uh, Magnum Pi Simmons, and that was a that was a great show. We had a good time, but you know, Ty and I, you know, there's a chemistry there. Look at me, buddy. Look at me in the eyes. <laughs> yeah, it's there. <laughs> and we have a very special guest today. Who who who's coming to hang out with us today, Ty? One of my favorite people from the Expanse, my good buddy Spider. <laughs> um, uh, Lou and Webb, who was with us very early on and leveled up multiple times to increasingly uh, higher responsibilities on the show. He was early on, he was a uh, first AD for us. Then later he came on as a producer. Then he became sort of the lead producer Whose for the post production. I don't know, it's not mine. Oh, it's sorry. Lewin's. Oh, um, yeah, became our, our, our sort of main producer for all the post production stuff. Uh, yeah, just uh, I think. What did you? What did you graduate as a supervising producer for the show? Is that right? Uh, I ultimately, in season six, was anointed as a co-executive. Oh producer. wow! I yeah, know. shocking, eh? You, yeah. So he leveled up multiple times across the show, and and always because we, you know, Narain would have him do something, he'd be really good at it, and then Narain would say, "Hey, I wonder." Lewin was really good at that last thing. I wonder if he'd be good at this thing too. And the answer was always yes. Well, because when he came to the expanse, he already was a director. He already he was yep. like first AD was years ago. So he's done every job. It's like the yep. the Canadian version of uh, James Cameron, where he can do every single job on set and knows yeah. every single job yeah. on set. <laughs> except, except that James Cameron's Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're the poor man's James Cameron. How do we like he's, that? Yeah. he's the Canadian James Cameron without the enormous uh, wealth and success. So when we say Canadian, <laughs> just so you know, uh, when Americans say Canadian, that's like saying the poor man's the poor man's version of that. All right, I wasn't I wasn't saying like he's actually from Canada. I was saying it's the Canadian version, right? So what, what you're saying is is that when Americans use the term Canadian, you actually do mean it. Is a pejorative. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, okay. it, you know, it, it's, we're, we're uh, we tell the truth on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. the, the 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 out of our five fans, we five listeners. Sorry, I don't like the name fans. Ty loves Ty loves it. Five. Oh yeah, yeah. We've got we're up. To, wait, what is it? Is it five? I think we're up to five. Well, it now. used to be eight. It used so to be eight, down, but those were down. the three Canadians <laughs> that, that, <laughs> they just left. that listened to this. Yeah, they're like, you motherfuckers. Like, I barely even like this show, and now you're going to make fun of my country? Fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about today, Ty? Somebody had the brilliant idea to bring Lewin on to talk about the one ship episodes the little mini episodes we did in season six. After five seasons of trying to do mini episodes, they finally let us let us do them in season six, and uh, Lewin uh, wound up directing all of them. So it seemed like a good time to bring him on. And so, oh, so they were trying to do this for a while. This this is a part of the X Ray division at Amazon, right? So they were. This is something they were yeah. trying to do for a while. No, so it, it wasn't the X Ray division that was trying to do it. It was Narain. Uh, Noreen had been talking about doing little webisodes or mini episodes or like just some way to, to have a little bit of extra content we could put out that would inform things that happened on the show or, you know, if people wanted deep dives into stuff, we could do stuff. He was always pitching that idea. I think that started in season two or three. He was pitching that idea. Mm hmm. And everybody liked it. Everybody liked the idea of it. But the problem was nobody wanted to pay for it. Nobody actually wanted, you know, and they're short. You know, they're, they're the ones we did in season six are only a few minutes long, but it still requires a film crew and film crews are expensive mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to pay for, for a and, day of shooting for the film crew. actors. <laughs> <laughs> they have to get, they'll have to get those guys out of bed. Yeah. So it was finally in season six that Amazon, uh, the X-ray Division, as you're talking about, ponied up a little money. Mm. They said, we'll give you X dollars to make these five short episodes. And it was enough for us to do the five episodes we did. If you remember, um, we did do X-ray content 
in I think four and five. We yeah. did the uh, we did the um, uh, the campaign spots for yep. Sarala and all that sort of stuff. Which well, was we sort did of some round tables to too. Yeah, we, well, yeah, but we yep. but we did added we did um, yep. additional content type stuff. Yeah, but I think it was in season four where they did commission Illus season four. Yeah, season four where they where they did commission the Anteros incident. And so there is actually that script still kicking around that I think Glenton wrote, which was that really brilliant piece about um, Adolphus Murtry and Chandra Way and why she was so obligated to him always. So great yeah. unproduced piece of expense. I, I would I would say that, that that the script for that is the best writing Glenton did for the show. I, that's my favorite thing he wrote. I know we're now talking about uh, one uh, a, a short that didn't get produced, which is yeah. which is a shame. But yeah, it was great. It was yeah. so tight. It was so well done, and it was yeah. so evocative of of the whole show. It was really really cool. And it and it was his it was his success writing that that caused Narain to uh, have him do you know to shepherd the the X rays through. Yeah. You know, we had other In, people work with Glenton, but yeah. Juliana right, yeah. Damewood and Glenton yeah. were the primaries. And there was yeah. some there was some other guy who also wrote one of them. Yeah. Um he was massively rewritten. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. You mean the way we used to overdub him when he was on set as well? <laughs> like 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 when Mel Gibbs, like when Mad Max first came to uh to the United yeah. States and it was like it just completely it was like nothing like connected to his voice or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's how that that's how that came about. That Amazon, thank you to Amazon, they ponied up some money and we were able to shoot five little episodes. So Juliana Damewood, who was our writer's assistant through several seasons of the show, and uh Glenton Richards, who had been our writer's assistant and PA before that, the two of them we had them write these episodes or at least oversee the writing of the episodes, make sure they got done and do like first drafts and that kind of stuff. And it, uh, it turned out really nice. Uh, Wes wanted to write an episode, and to everyone's great misgivings, Noreen agreed to let that happen. So he and Glenton worked on one together. So that was cool. But what what was the purpose of these X rays story wise? Were they thematically consistent? Were they all trying to add to character, like to dimensions in the world, or what? What was the purpose of the the uh, the X rays? I don't know what Amazon what their goal with x-ray is and sometimes i wonder if they know what their goal with x-ray is because it's it it's interesting to have extra content that you can access while you're watching it which is what x-ray does but the kind of content you can get through x-ray is very inconsistent and it's and in some platforms it's very difficult to find so the biggest complaint we got about our x-ray stuff for season 6 is it was really hard to watch it you had to be watching it on a computer using certain browsers. Yeah. You, you know, if you were if you were watching our show on your smart TV or on your PlayStation or on your Roku or whatever, it was almost impossible to get the the X-ray shorts to play. So I I I I, I would love to talk to somebody at Amazon who works at X-ray <laughs> and ask them what it is they're trying to accomplish. For us, story-wise, what we wanted to do is take little character moments. It's the same thing Daniel and I do with the novellas. Take little character moments that don't fit in the main story, but show an interesting aspect of a character or, or a piece of world building and, and give a little space for that thing, right. which is what we were trying to do with these. And um, because, and you're right, it was difficult because I haven't seen, the, the only short that I've seen is the one we're talking about today, and that's because that it was sent to me and I saw it then. But when I watched the show... I would always have that thought of like, oh, I want to watch those X-rays. Oh, I want to, and and I never connected to like how to watch them. It wasn't like when you're watching the show, it's like, hey, you know, pop up, you want to watch X-ray or whatever, come and and watch those. But I watch them before we talk to. I watch all the other ones before we talk about them. It is weird that you can on almost any platform you can just sort of see the basic behind the scenes, like the gallery yeah. photographs and that sort of right. thing. Right. Yeah. But it's the the lack of access does is is I, although the flip side of that is is that when when the show was up. Um, when the last season ran, everyone kept talking about it. How come oh I God. can't see these things? Yeah. So, I also thought, Ty, that there was an element of uh, they gave us a short order in season six, and yeah. so there was a it was an element of um, hey, let's do this as well. When I discovered, I remember discussing it with you and Daniel and Lorraine. It was um, the fact that you had always had those brilliant 
uh, complementary novellas that it it dovetailed really really nicely with the show as well as you as you say it was a really nice way of of getting character insight but also um, the one we did with Clarissa Nightwatch we did a yeah. you know we did a little tease of um, of when she's in the engine room and she's sort of checking out for things yeah. to do the pipe that we find busted in six oh six that creates that level of jeopardy we set up in that yeah. particular one ship as with everything in your show layers and sophistication for that one specifically the nice thing about being able to do these is once clarissa is on the ship a question that i think everybody's going to have on the back of their mind is how is she dealing with what her father did how is she dealing with that what how has that affected her and there's really no good place to put that because you know we did only we only had six episodes we had to move through story quickly there was no good place to have her just sit and have a conversation with somebody about that. That did, that wouldn't have felt like it was a stall for the other things we needed to get to. And so being able to put that into one of these x-rays, uh, just a couple of minutes of Clarissa sort of talking about her father and, and the relationship that they yeah. had and how this has affected her, it felt like a really lovely moment that people would be wondering about that we couldn't fit anywhere else. And that was, that was the really great part of being able to make these. I did watch another one. I remember now that Narain he sent it to me, and it was uh, really beautiful. It was the one where Drummer gets a call, mm. a voicemail from yeah. Naomi, yep. and you really see the depth of the feeling that they have for each other and the relationship, and that there's something you know really, really even already there's something deeper there between them. And I was really moved by that. And I definitely felt like that enriched the series going forward, understanding that the emotional connection, the relationship, it's kind of like Ty, when we talked about uh, last of us, the, uh, what were the two guys, name, the love story between the two guys, um, oh, Bill and, um, Bill and Frank. Bill and Frank. So you think about yeah. that Bill and Frank episode where it kind of is parallel within the universe, but it's not really a part of the main through narrative. Yeah. Um, but it enriches and really, you know, brings to life that those characters, but the world and the emotional impact that it, that world has on people. That was the uh, that was Ankoala. The um, that was yeah. the accompanying episode for six hundred one. So that was actually the very first one in the series of the one ships. I really enjoyed that. I remember uh, when they started talking about uh, these episodes, these short films, and and I was talking to Rain about it, and you know, every interview or. Whenever I talk to somebody, they said, who would win in a fight? You know, Frankie or Amos. Uh, and it's you always say or, um, or Bob, Bobby Draper. And, you, you know, it's like it's Bobby. If somebody is trained and they know what they're doing, no matter how talented that the amateur is and how physical that guy is, they're always going to win. But there was something interesting within that question. And I started thinking about like my favorite dick measuring scene of all time and that's in jaws when <laughs> the USS Annapolis scene yeah. where yep. you know they're they're looking at each other's scars and it's just great. I mean it's just, it just hits on so many notes. That's why like I I agree, I agree with Tarantino's assessment that Jaws is the greatest movie ever made, not necessarily the greatest film, but the greatest movie ever made. And that scene to me is what really elevates that to that level. Um, especially when he brings it down and tells the real story of the USS Annapolis. But there's just a camaraderie and a spirit of them, and they're comparing their scars, and it might as well have been their dicks. You know, it might as yeah. well have been. And so kind of taking that spirit, that like masculine competition of Amos and Bobby, like what I would imagine, like, you know, what it was like when you're hanging out with the guys that you're serving with, you know, guys that you're in the, the military with and where. You're just looking for vulnerabilities. You're just looking for weaknesses. And it's just one-upping. It's just one-upping as that goes to the apex where you're actually physically having a, a combat situation. Then through the combat situation, you see the expression of the argument that was happening before. Because Amos is like, you know, I, you guys pretend a lot. You train a lot. You practice a lot. That's a different than the real-world violence and real-world dangerous and so when you're in that, physica that physical battle with each other, the expression of somebody that has all the options, you know, if you, if you train jiu-jitsu or for boxing or anything, and um, you have these parameters, right? You got the mats, you know, you got rules, you got regulations, and you get really good within that, <laughs> within that realm. But if somebody's surviving out in the streets, 
their whole life, they might not hold a candle to the physical combat, but they have all these other creative possibilities. They can pick up something to hit you with. Like they, they're used to thinking and surviving in a different way. And so that actual physical battle was, a, was an expression of that. And I don't know, you know, speaking of James Cameron, when James Cameron found out we were doing these x-rays, um, he was all over me about directing uh, this, yeah. this specific one all over. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He was like really wanting to be a part of it. And we were like, let me tell you something. We got Llewellyn Webb here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we, we got the real Canadian. You know, James Cameron yeah, is the, the Canadian. The real Canadian. Yeah. The real Canadian. Yeah, we got the right. real Canadian here. Um, <laughs> for all of your listeners, we should clarify that what Wes is actually talking about is the accompanying episode 603, Win or Lose, written by Wes Chatton, starring Wes Chatton, along with um, the inimitable uh, Frankie Adams. And Lewin directed. And Lewin, and, Lewin, and Lewin directed all of the episodes. And I think the best day that I had at work ever on The Expanse was that day. That was such a fun day. We were in there. And Lewin, I, I, had a, I, I think you're a phenomenal director. I mean, I think that you're all levels of understanding of like the ti- like timing, but also understanding the, the, the camera angles, understanding actors understanding what they're trying to do. You know, all those dimensions were firing. How did you feel about that, the whole X-ray well, experience? <laughs> uh, a, I'm blushing. Uh, B, um, it was a blast. I mean, every, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, am I allowed to swear? Yeah, it was a yes. fucking blast. I yeah. mean, they were, I mean, everything about it, everything you alluded to, how they came about, everything about how we had to do them, um, because uh, some of them got tagged on to the end of when we were finishing. So there was something incredibly bittersweet about the experience. I have to express um, there was an enormous amount of kindness from every one of you, every one of the cast, in terms of, um, you know, I'm a jobber and I've been there and I've been a third eye for so much of this show. And so everybody was was so giving and so considerate from behind the camera to in front of the camera. So, I mean, personally, I found it redemptive. Now it was it was a really it was a it was a lot of fun, but it was also because I was I was present almost every single day on set. You know uh, that the nature of what my job was, you know, supporting the Jeff Walnos, the Breck Eisners, every one of our directors being there and trying to ensure that everything was done in a in a comprehensive, creative uh, but timely way. There was always shit that I would see. There was always stuff that I would think. Oh, we should do that sometime, or that would be cool. And occasionally, you know, in prep, I would get to have those conversations with the the likes of Breck or Jeff, and we would cook up some cool stuff. But then there were other things which never manifested themselves. And I'm talking about shot making and just different ideas and just different concepts and different emotionalities and that sort of thing. And so I was able to scratch that a little bit by directing the one ships. So in that in that sense. Everyone always sort of says this, and this is, provides me an opportunity and a forum to do it. Every single show I've ever worked on, everyone always goes, oh, it's the best thing I ever did. Oh, it was the greatest experience I ever had. In all sincerity, and I don't think there's a person who connected with this particular project who doesn't think this, The Expanse was a professional experience of a lifetime. It was so collaborative. It was so, I mean, the, the quality of the leadership allowing the fostering and the growth of creativity and the contributions from everywhere. You know, you find a good idea everywhere. You can take advantage of a good idea from anyone, which sounds terrible in one sense, but it was a hothouse environment. And like anyone else in this industry, yeah, I've experienced directing and being a creative producer and that sort of thing. And it was the one itch that I never got to scratch on the show until the one ships came along. And it was a blast. Like I can't. It was. It was just so much fun. But it was also fun because of the challenges of knowing. Okay, we've got Dominic is only available for. I think we had four hours, and we have to get all that stuff that we did with her. Multiple yeah. different looks, representing different seasons, shooting in visual effects environments, you know, all that sort of thing. And then we had to. You know, I seem to remember that we had we and again you alluded to the fact I, that we only had so much money. So effectively, we had one day 
for each yeah. of these things and just how to make it all work. And, you know, we were supposed to be using all of the existing elements. So how do, how do we get Avisrala's grandchild on Earth? And everybody wanted to go back to the house that you used in season one and, and have that sort of snowy, sort of the, 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 the atmosphere of Earth. And, you know, so we actually threw that set. How much pre-production time did you have to prep? 20 minutes. Um, it was, That's, it was, they gave you 20 minutes you're gonna get lazy you bastard getting all that time yeah but it was it was all it was it was it was the team had a fair bit of time with the script so they were able to mature and or gestate and mature which was really really helpful yeah so we could take time with that so we knew that there was and you know working with you and Stephen and 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 Sheree and everybody it's 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 you guys had them everybody contributed as you always did you always sort of went through your read throughs you always had really good insightful sentient things to uh, comments to improve the quality and the structure of the of the scripts as we went through them so we went through that and then as I, as I say you know it's it's I'm often asked what my role was on the expense and sometimes you know I. I was the guy who had to put the needle to a lot of directors and sort of keep them honest and keep them moving and keep the quality up, but also keep it within the, con- the you know, con- the confinement of, of time, money, and space and that sort of thing. So the last thing in the world I could do when given the keys to the proverbial was ever not deliver on that level. Yeah. And, you know, it's... Yeah, you would have had Breck Eisner jumping out of the shadows <laughs> going, ah <laughs> Not as you easy went as over. You think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you almost gave I think you might have gave just so you know the the bylaws of this podcast. I, we do not compliment Breck Eisner on this podcast. And, Sorry. and you, you I think you gave him one. I think you did. But that's all right, Joseph. We'll, uh, we'll cut that out. All right. <laughs> Joseph, don't cut it out. He's a worthy, worthy person. <laughs> What's funny is like, because we have Breck on all the time. What's funny is like the. Yeah, uh, I've noticed. The, uh, the, <laughs> but like the, the listeners will, will like bag on, like will pile on <laughs> Breck. Like if you look in the YouTubes, like the stuff that when we give him a hard time, the listeners, like they just jump on it and just like rip him a new one. It's the best. It's the best. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say this much. When he joined us in season two, and I think every single person on the, uh, production this is from a production point of view we were all like what the fuck who is this bloke and by the end of season six he was a beloved yeah if not lame younger nephew no he was i i I cannot (laughs) i cannot say enough about about breck and and i mean the two stand out obviously of breck and jeff because of uh their yeoman like and just their contributions were huge to the show and to the and their understanding of the craft and I have never had so much fun working on a show as I did working on the expanse. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. And you well you <laughs> you know what's funny is uh you brought up um how everybody says that. So when I'm every time I'm watching an interview or watching they're like, Oh my God, it, how is so and so oh they're fucking they're the best. They're the great I have, I, I have a crush on them. Oh they're fucking oh, they're, oh, and I'm always like shut your fucking mouth. There's somebody you didn't like and you're lying. Yeah. You're being inauthentic and I'm the asshole on the shows that are like, yeah, man, this is the best set I've ever been on. Like, these people are awesome. Like, it's great. It's like friends I've had. And it almost makes me want to work on a bad set so I can be like, oh, fuck all of those people. They suck. They suck, you know? And Because, you know, Ty and I, we, we talk about everything that we love on the show. And, you know, we didn't know it was going to become a phenomenon. But um, we talk about all the stuff that we love. And then there's a moment I'm like, Ty, all we do is like, just praise things like we need to put a we need to pick a movie or a tv show that we fucking hate oh and, so and, and like the most dismantle it the know? most popular youtube channels are the ones that every episode is about hating something really oh yeah oh we've been hate doing it all so wrong much more this is popular. a love fest here yeah. hate is so much more popular than well, love damn yeah. it oh, you'll, get, you'll get way more views if you hate on stuff I, I got to tell you, I, I really enjoyed, but I found The Last of Us incredibly harrowing to watch. Yeah. Um, just just, just uh, uh, remarkable that anything could be. And it, it was almost like your your pod, your discussions were, were almost a solve to that. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was so intense at times that it was a relief to listen to, to it being deconstructed. Just like, it, 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 I know it sounds bizarre, but... I an amazing show and just, fuck it, I, I found it really, uh, not hard because it wasn't good, 
hard because it put me on an emotional plane that was so intense yeah. all the time. Did, so, did, they, anyway. did they ever shoot up near you guys up north they of the border? They shot up in Calgary, I think. Yeah, they shot. Oh, they they, did? they shot in Alberta. Yeah. yeah. So it was. That's where they were based. Yeah. So uh-huh. It was. Uh, that was. That was. Although you I couldn't tell moving, because it was always two. everything was covered with snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was only that one episode when it was all covered in snow, right? Or was there a bunch? No, there more? was multiple snowy episodes. Well, yeah, there's. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's, there's a few. I have a memory like Dory. Like, we've moved on from that show. <laughs> I'm like, I have no fucking... Who was in that show? <laughs> so let's let's talk about um, the process of making... Since we're talking about the x-ray shorts, let's talk about the process of making them. So, like, one of the things that changed in season six for the, the show in general is we had a much smaller writer's room. It was basically just Juliana, Noreen, Dan Nowak, and Daniel and I. That was it. That was the whole writer's room. Oh, and Glenton. Excuse me. Glenton was still there. So it was just us. It was just the six of us making, making the show. And what wound up happening is uh, Noreen felt like the only way we could get it done is to split up storylines and, and just have one writer write that entire storyline through all six seasons. So, you know, Dan wrote all of the Marco and, and Philip stuff and, and, uh, I wrote all of the Amos stuff and, and uh, Noreen wrote all of the, or Daniel wrote all the Elvis or all this stuff. And so, so we, we sort of, and Noreen wrote all the drummer stuff. So we sort of split it up that way. Right. And I think that sort of bled over into the, the one ship episodes where it became sort of super collaborative like that. Cause like Juliana and Clinton and you Wes, like all were working on different scripts of that. But at the same time, like, you know, Noreen did a dialogue pass on the drummer one. I did a dialogue pass on the the Bobby and Amos one. Like, like the it, it felt like all of the writers, including the writers who were specifically brought on for one show, it was a much more collaborative version of that than uh, in previous seasons, and that was that was a lot of fun. I feel like that's the the, the spirit of the expanse. Is like it's extremely collaborative, and what to go back to what Lewin was saying earlier, you know, in terms of ideas, you know, like, uh, Narain was extremely like, and he would invite the best ideas, invite collaboration, invite input. He would allow these punk ass actors to want to rehearse on Sunday and like rehearse with the writer and like really kind of hone and go through everything. And he just kind of lifted everybody up. He kind of lifted everybody up that was around him. Well, you always, you, I mean, he wanted to make sure everybody felt like they were heard. Uh-huh. He wasn't. He wasn't gonna do what everybody told him to do. Oh, like you know, if, if he didn't like your idea, he was gonna say no. <laughs> Listen, I've seen him feel a lot of bad ideas, and, yeah. and he handles it with grace. But it's clear <laughs> that he's like that idea ain't going nowhere, buddy. You know what I'm saying? Well, but but yeah. he always wanted to make sure everybody felt like their idea was yeah. heard honestly. Yeah. You know, he'll, rather he'll than listen just to your shitty idea. idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, th- that was all uh, preamble for me. The, the part I was building up to is that because none of us were on set, it almost felt like we were more collaborative in the prep stuff because we didn't have the ability to do that on location anymore. And everything on location felt very sort of segmented and chopped up. So you guys were actually there. Lewin, you were there for all of this stuff. Is that how it felt being up there? That it was sort of that sort of on-site collaboration that we had always had through the first five seasons sort of was no longer available. But in some ways, on site, and Wes, obviously you can speak to this as well, but it was, it was, in some ways, it was even more because, of course, when we did season six, we were smack dab in the middle of the lockdown and pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And so we, it was a bizarre experience because I can remember we had, we, we, we had, because we had, we were rebuilding, um, series we had to we took over another massive facility on the west end of the city and i can remember driving out to the canadian national exhibition grounds and, and the Embridge center where we shot and we built that whole you know we built the Zenobia and the satellite uh, the asteroid surface i mean and a bunch of the other sort of additional sets that we have for that season there'd be no one on the roads the city was quiet we we in a way on in that season, and we, I mean, the collective of the shooting company, we had a privileged position because we were leaving our homes and we were going out and we were actually engaging and interacting with our 
you know, for a, a crew, our friends, our, our all our collaborators, um, in a way that no one else around us. You know, my wife would. Was, my wife's a, a, a news journalist for the CBC. She was sitting downstairs, sitting in editorial meetings at our dining table. I was getting to actually go out and live a quasi normal life, and it it had, a, I perceive, it had a it had a powerful effect on that season, on how we did things, on how close everything was. You know, I hate to use the word. It was you know, we we always had the sanctity of the show and the bubble of the show. That's the word I was trying not to use. And it was even in some ways more intense when we shot season six. Your absence, I was going to say something really soppy, but your absence made your presence and our adher- adherence to the scripts and to the process even more intense. That's mm. how I always, but maybe because I was infused with a certain, you know, an added responsibility. Yeah. I mean, I always, I, I mean, Rain and I spoke all the time. Yeah. And I realized everybody was tapped in through, you know, things like this, but there were, there really was, uh, there was also an awareness of the fact that we were doing the, the, we were doing the, the last season until we're able to do more seasons. We knew that there wouldn't be a season seven immediately at that point. And there was a real sense of commitment and fulfillment, but also of a journey ending. Um, I'd like to think everybody raised their game. As trite as that sounds, everybody yeah. really was conscious of the fact that we were, we'd in a way been allowed, we have become protectors of the show in the absence of our leaders, our creative, you know, our creative friends who normally would be there riding shotgun with us. It turned out amazingly well. And part of what happened was with you, Lewin, is you, you had always been sort of you know, the, the Darth Vader to, to Narain's emperor always, but even more so in season six, you became the physical Narain stand in. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even, even more than you had been previously. So I think that was a big part of it is the, the show never felt like it didn't have on site leadership because you had slid into that right. role. Yeah. And, and sort of became the on site version of Narain. Yeah. yeah. And as you said, you were talking to him constantly so that that channel yeah. of communication was still there. Uh, but without somebody to do that, I think it would have been much more chaotic. Exactly. I think, you know, you got to have on site leadership or things start to get shaky pretty fast. I have a question for you, Wes. Like, given all of this, when when Noreen agreed to let you and Glinton write the one ship episode that you worked on, what was what was your process? So this is how it worked with Noreen. He sent me ideas and I said, I'm not using myself as leverage. I wouldn't do that to you to be in it or not be in it. But, you know, in the rain is him and I have talked a long time about the rotting process. And he was like, you know, you know, like I'm going to do whatever I can to help you or whatever. So I said, you know, let me pitch this idea to you. And if you like this idea better, then, uh, then, then, then we'll go, we'll go that one step and then allow me to write the outline. And if you like that outline, allow me to do the first draft and then if I do the first draft, then I'll, and, and, and give me a pass. So how it worked was is I wrote the outline. He said, okay, I like the outline. Do the first pass. I did the first pass. He said, okay, gave me notes. And he said, write, write the second draft. I did the second draft. He says, okay, cool. You know, and I know that Glinton, you know, was, was a major part of all of that. When it showed up for me was it was basically done. Noreen came to me and said, I, need, I, need the, I just need the dialogue punched up. I just need it. I, did, I need it punchier. And I did my dialogue pass, mostly focusing on that back and forth scene between that you had already done a draft of. So it was already in the script. I wasn't adding anything. It was just to make it a little punchier. And I did my pass. And, and I said to Randy, he goes, this is great. This is fucking hilarious. He sent it to the network. Amazon came back and said, we think this is too mean. Yeah. <laughs> You guys are being, you guys are being way too mean to each other. And I was like, have you ever met military people? This is how they talk to each other. That's interesting to me because, you know, I still have like the rough draft that I wrote and that was the note that got back to me because I still like the rough draft because it, it has a lot more edge to it, a lot more. And the thing is, is that the, the thing that's interesting about that scene is the harder they come at each other, the more they start to like each other. And it's, it's, it's a building of a friendship. You know what's funny is uh, two days ago, a guy that I trained with, 
His name is Austin, and he was in the Marine Corps Reserves. And he was showing me a video of uh, this this uh, this vehicle he was working on, this thing he's working on. And so I'm, I'm looking at this vi- this uh, video of him working on this, and I see out of the corner this one guy just double leg blast this other guy off off his feet on his back into the ground. They hit the gra- they fuck they they glide in the in the dirt, and they're just going at it like they're just you know just totally. Uh, going out, and I think you know they're probably just starting to to learn some jujitsu and like doing it there. But he had did a straight bl- blast double leg and like took him off his thing, slid in the grass, and they're just fucking going at it. And then I was like, "What's going on over there?" And he goes, "Oh, they're just you know you know when you get a bunch of guys in the desert, and then you see, I mean, they're fucking going at it, right? And then they stop, and you see them just laughing and smiling and like you know just cracking each other and ribbing on each other. And it's like that's a part of camaraderie that's a part of building friendship particularly in those type of like those type of military type groups and so like communicating to that the the thing that's interesting within it is like how hard they are on each other is how much they like each other you know and then the the apex of their of the the climax of the the thing is when bobby loses and loves the fact that she loses. It makes her laugh. And she looks at, you know, she looks at Amy and she's like, you sneaky bastard, you know, and like, and appreciates that. And it's a part of that, that friendship thing. So when I first started doing that, I remember getting some notes from the rain and it's like, you know, it, like things felt a little bit, you know, the edge was a little bit, you know, much. And then we, and then we were kind of going back and forth and kind of taking some of those things out and <clears throat> to make it a little bit. And, and he did mention that the network said that. And I was like, this is what the scene, this is, this is what makes it interesting because there's a friendship building and they'll learn at the end that they, that this is them building respect and appreciating each other. And even if they think, oh my God, are they, are they, is this going to end up in like them like hurting each other? Have, then it'll be more interesting for them when, when the reverse happens. We actually had a call on that. We actually had to, I had to do that whole directorial thing. It's almost verbatim what you were saying, Wes of speaking to the studio, well, to Amazon, and reassuring them that, you know, that the essence of the piece was not, it's going to sound terrible, but was not about, you know, the male character and the female character and, and the and the, the fact that, you know, the white male and the, the, the BIPOC, like they were concerned about those things. And so oh. you and I had these very conversations yeah, and I remember the specific line. You remember when Mars had two moons, which which yeah. I love. But I remember like them saying, "Ah, that's a little harsh because that really means a lot to Frankie because yeah. you know the Mars is so important and it's a camaraderie." And I'm like, "Then that's exactly where he would go. He would exactly 100%. go to where and, that is." But then, <laughs> and then when we were shooting it, I'm I just going to say because when we we're shooting it, then you two, because it wasn't scripted, but it was just something that you and and Frankie did in terms of the, you know, the, the classic moment of reaching up the hand oh, to help yeah. her up yeah. and, and, the, and the brush off, <laughs> yeah. which just is such a beautiful little, <laughs> yeah. it's, yep. and it's, 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 it just make you know, it's, it's everything from leave it to be, but it's just, it's, it's sort of in a, in a, a big word, perhaps wrong intent, but it's such a lovely sort of visual uh, iconic thing. It was, it was just, I found their concern. And I'm, I'm and I, this is not to bash anybody at Amazon. They they have a job to do, and they're they're doing that job. So I'm not bashing anybody. But I found the object of their concern vaguely insulting, because the note that we consistently kept getting is, "Well, is this going to read like Amos being mean to a girl?" Yep. And my reaction to that is, she's not a girl. She's a fucking special forces gunnery sergeant. She's a recon marine. She's not. A girl. She's one of the badass, most badass killers in the solar system, and she's kicking my ass. <laughs> and and to yeah. and to and to reduce her to she's a girl and boys shouldn't be mean to her is insulting. They should have been worried that she was going to kill Amos, right? Not not that like oh her feelings are going to be hurt because a boy was mean to her. That I found very frustrating. Whenever we got that, no, well, is it going to come across as Amos is being mean to a girl? I'm like, stop describing her that way. Yes, she's female, but that's not the that's not the thing that's awesome about her. The point of her, the point of her is she's a fucking special forces killer. <laughs> and and when these two these two killers recognize each other as killers and they're circling each other and they're growling 
and barking. This is how, this is just how these, this kind of person interacts. That's just what it is. And to reduce it to one of them is this gender or, or whatever is, is I, I think frankly was to me kind of insulting. <laughs> yeah. And missing the point. And yeah. me, me as an actor, the scene in season six, uh, uh, episode five, when I, when I'm, when I'm hammered and like got glitter all over my face and I've been up in the brothels yeah. and, and, and I'm talking to her, when we have that conversation, I used the scene that we had as our yeah. relationship moment before. Yeah. So I brought the yep. camaraderie that we've built in that scene, which you can only build through that kind of, that kind of humor and that kind of shared humor and that kind of physical aggression that you have with each other and then appreciating and respecting each other. So I brought that there to that moment in that scene that that started off with. Then I was like, you know, I don't know if I would have said, hey, do you want to come with? If we didn't have that moment before of like that yeah. physical, like she's, I like her. Like she's a part of my, you know, my, my squad, my team, you know. But, and, 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 and even in the writing of that scene, a big part of it was, you know, a big part of the argument I was making is the only person in the solar system that Amos can have this conversation with is Bobby. The only one who he has enough respect for as a, a badass soldier and as somebody who has been through the shit and understands what the shit looks like is Bobby. And so he tussled with her. He respects her as a combatant. He's seen her fight. He respects her as a soldier. And so when he sits down and goes, I don't know why I'm fighting anymore, he can open himself up in that way only to her. There's nobody else on the ship he could have had that conversation with. And vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. yeah. It, absolutely. And that was always, that was the thesis that we took it, we went to the floor with as yeah. well. I mean, Wes very kindly shared through the process, um, you know, his step outline and his first, first drafts, to yeah. come back to your earlier point. And I, I can remember you you and Stephen were shooting, on, you were on the exterior of the Ross and Ante and we were chatting and he said to me, have you read it? Have you read it? And I was like, yeah, and I was thinking we could do this and this oh, yeah. would be really cool. And he just looked at me and he went, yeah, no, it's this. And <laughs> I went, yeah, okay. <laughs> but that was cool because it was contextual. Yeah. yeah. And it was, and, and I was like, okay, so fine. So how do I take this? And how do I, yeah. So yeah. It, I, I, that always stayed with me though. I was now, like, I, oh. And I, I would, I do want to make one clarification for the, the listeners who have not been through this process, just so it doesn't sound like I'm taking credit for Wes's script. When, when a showrunner asks you to punch up the dialogue, what they're saying is don't rewrite it. Don't change the context. Don't change what was actually in the script. Just take out as many words as you can. And that's really what a punch up is. Just, just reduce these lines and these thoughts to the minimum number of words necessary to say that thing, which is really all I was doing. So I wasn't rewriting Wes's idea or anything. It was just you know, boil it down to the, the minimum, which is, which is a process that every script goes through no matter who wrote it. So I, I don't want to take any of Wes's credit away is what I'm saying. Like the process that we went through on that script is the same one we would have done if I had written the first draft or Daniel had written the first draft or Dan Nowak had written the first draft. It's the same process. You know, I, just not Narain. Yeah. You know, uh, Narain, <laughs> oh, I've, um, I've, I've tweaked some of Narain's I, I dialogue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But Narain gave me an opportunity that is reverberating through my career now as it speaks. And like, I'm forever grateful for that, to give me that opportunity to do that. Now, I promised Joseph that we would keep it in an hour when we do these shorts. Um, we're going we're gonna to go back. I mean, we're going to do all the shorts um, and focus on each story and everything like that. But one question that I'm, I'm curious about, and I, and I know, obviously, I believe uh, working with you as a director that it is directing. But uh, so... Take directing aside, out of all the hats that you wore on set, what do you enjoy the most or feel mo most creatively satisfying? Like, what do you look forward to the most in, in all of those hats that you wore? And, and take directing as, and, and Direct, not include Yeah, directing? that's obvious. I worked with you as a director. I saw oh, the joy yeah. and the glee that you had from it. But just in terms of like a little bit of inside baseball, like other jobs on set that you've done that you really, really enjoy. Well, that's funny because you, 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 Noreen always used to call me, always used to say that I was this unusually unique left brain, right brain, and he had never encountered anybody really like me before. A creative producer who had the fundamentals of production and, and how, to, how to execute in a way that he hadn't come across before. Um, I always, not that I know your 
great American pastime too well, but you know, there's there's this notion of the five tool player. Ty, you were talking about the episode uh, where we where we plan and prep, we go through the process, we determine how best to execute, giving all of the uh, you know, it's building the box, yeah, and then figuring out a way to blow that box up. And in a way, that's what always my job ends up being. People always go, "Oh, Lewin, you're the fix it guy," and I'm like, "No, I'm the let's not let it get broken in the first place guy. Let's find the best way, the most creative way within the means of time and money." that we have to get the, whatever the essence, the point, the, the hook is across. And I, I, I love that. I, I love leading the team. I love being part of the team. I love the process of planning and the process of executing the process of taking the words and amplifying them on the screen and then refining them in the post-production process. Like it's again. I was talking to Joseph earlier about um, what I think is the best book about filmmaking, Michael and Dachi's, um in conversations with Walter Murch, and the basic thesis of that book is storytelling takes place in in this medium, film and television, in three stages: in the writing, in the shooting, and in the editing, in the cutting. I think also you the the, the joy of being on the um, sound mix stage where you can so enhance. Uh, the emphasis of drama and the, the, the every element of it in that. So I always add that as the as the quasi fourth stage. But you know, comprehensively, it's it's you know I've produced a bunch of films, and you don't have a writer showrunner in those instances. The sort of the, the position I hold as a producer is as a non writing showrunner, and so I love that relationship with. Narain and I recently did a show with Glenn Mazzara and some other folks and just and you know with Ty and with Daniel and Dan Nowak you mentioned a number of times Dan was a great collaborator yeah. it's just it's just you guys have a sensibility of what it is that you want directors come in with a with a optimization of what they want and then my role always is the okay how do we I'm a bit of the realist how do we actually do this to get to the essence of what's on the page in the most exemplary way. That's, that's, yeah. I love it. That, my, my, my description of that is Breck would come in to direct the first block. He would try to use all 10 episodes money <laughs> <laughs> for his block. Right. Like I would take all the money and I'm going to use it on my block. Yeah. And then, and then Narain and, and Lewin would go in and go, no, you can't actually have all of the money <laughs> yeah. and all of the shooting days. You're only shooting two episodes and get him back down to where he was only using, you know, his part of it. But and, and it seemed like most directors come in with that, like, I'm going to take up as much space as they let me take. So you need these people kind of pushing them back down into the shape that they're supposed to be. Yeah, but you also got to you have to speak their language. Yeah, it's like uh, <laughs> Brex movies like 2001. Like directed by Kubrick, and then the next movie we're like, pew 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 <laughs> pew pew pew. Ah, oh, you got like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it's like where did where did their guns go? We can't, and we don't even have. A, we don't, we're wearing like our our outfits that we walk around in town. And like we don't even have costumes anymore. <laughs> I, I remember in season three, we were you know because obviously we were on the what, what was the ship tied the Guanshin, and and we we were, it was the pickup at the end of the of the. Of, of season two and Breck had all of his, you know, the whole thing where they're trying to escape and get off the ship. And um, we were, we were scouting, we were walking around one of the stages and because of how complex our show was, you know, we were well in advance of building other sets for future episodes. And we were building the whole uh, lab structure for Katoa and the tunnel and all that sort of stuff was going up. And, I can remember just almost physically having to restrain Brack because he would be like, oh, what's this over here? Maybe we could put the scene in here. I'm like, no, you can't put the fucking scene in there. That goes into <laughs> Jeff Wilno's episode or that goes into Ken Fink's episode or that goes into – that's for that. But I, but you got to respect that. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, you yeah. know, you, you, if you don't have people who are pushing the envelope, like some of our best ideas came out of the, well, fuck, how are we going to achieve that? Well, that's that's going to be impossible to do. Okay, we'll stop. Maybe it's not impossible. How do we? I'm not allowed to use that expression because Narain will kill me. But you know, how do we skin the proverbial four-legged small animal? It's it's like you know that's that's the essence of 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 the process of what we do. Is yeah, that's a great idea. And fortunately, it's the James Cameron ten million dollar version or the hundred million dollar version. So how do we do it with a 
pack of chewing gum and a and a cup of coffee, you know, it's which is the reality. I assume for the uh win or lose short, uh Wes also in addition to being the lead actor, also stood in as the stunt coordinator. And, he, he also, uh, and he taught, also Bobby, did taught Bobby the moves that she was gonna use. <laughs> he also did craft service. Yeah. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they let you teach Bobby how to do the uh chokehold? Yeah. Or Frankie, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we worked yes. on it and everything like that. Yep. And um that was awesome, man. That was that was a you fun both day. were so enthusiastic. Yeah. Like you were both it was you made it really, really easy. Yeah. It was fun. That, that was, was fun. a lot of fun. That was fun. And then we even got it we even got a little fancy camera, you know, with the with the little time that we had. We had some good camera moves in there, you know. Yeah. So Well that was <clears throat> that's planning. Yeah, I think this is a good time to uh, wrap this up. We don't have a top five uh, today, but so is there a top five that you would want to do if you, when you come back on? Well, I, I, I'll think about that and let you know, but uh, probably. But um, right now I can say there happened to be five X-ray one ship shorts. So inherently there is a top five in this episode. Oh, I, don't, I, I don't know if we, can, if we could do a top five of, of the best x-rays on there because everybody knows fan favorite, but now I don't think we can, I don't think it'd be fair to do that, but um, listen, Lewin, we love you, buddy. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for spending time with us. You're such an important part of the team and, uh, and we appreciate you, man. Thank you guys for hanging out. Please like and subscribe. Every time you ring that little bell, Ty gets his horns. We love you. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.